Hey everyone, welcome back to Neurobiology at Providence College. I'm Joe DeGeorgis. Today we're going to continue with our conversation of the paper by Cartier Harlan and her colleagues who discovered a point mutation in the amyloid precursor protein that causes a familial or heritable form of Alzheimer's disease. And of course, I'm telling you the conclusion of the paper, which is also reflected in their title, which is Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease Caused by Mutations at Codon 717 of the Beta Amyloid Precursor Protein Gene. So, uh, of course, they've made this very interesting discovery about this particular point mutation in this family. Uh, but prior to this study, it's likely that they had identified many different families that have early onset forms of the disease, which were known to be heritable. And for each of the families, what scientists would like to know is what the mutation is that causes the disease in each of those families. And of course, it doesn't have to be the same mutation. We now know based on papers like this one, that there are many different point mutations in APP that cause the disease. And there's also many different mutations in other proteins, that is other genes, that also give rise to early onset forms of this disorder. In this particular family, they only had the pedigree in the inheritance pattern. And the inheritance patterns, we said the other day, follows an autosomal dominant pattern. And I'm gonna draw, not the one that's in the paper, but one that's similar, that outlines the, the pedigree, or those pedigrees, that follow an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Give me a second here. Let's say we have an afflicted male who marries an unafflicted woman. And they have an afflicted daughter who marries an unafflicted male and they have an afflicted son who marries an uninflicted woman. And I'm going to draw in some sons and daughters, which they don't do in figure one to protect the identity of the family. Okay, this is a typical autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. And we know that because the disease does not skip a generation, which would be indicative of a recessive disorder. There are individuals in each generation that are afflicted. And it turns out that about 50% of the offspring are afflicted with the disease. It can't be Y-linked because both men and women are afflicted, for instance, here and here, or here and here. And it can't be X-linked dominant because in an X-linked dominant inheritance pattern, any son that has the disease must have a mother that has it. She must be afflicted because she is passing one X chromosome. I mean, it's shown here, this, this mother, and let's say this son. She would have to be afflicted because she has two X chromosomes, and she must be passing on the afflicted X chromosome to her son if it's an autosomal dominant disorder she would have one good copy and one bad copy. She would be afflicted and her son would get the bad copy. So he would be afflicted. So it's not um, X-linked dominant um, 
with the diseased gene being carried by the mother or being possessed by the mother. And it can't be X-linked dominant from the father because the father, if he were afflicted, he would have obviously one bad copy of the X-linked gene and one copy of the Y chromosome. So in that case, none of his sons would be afflicted because um, he would give them the Y chromosome and all of his daughters would be afflicted. And we see that that's not the case, for instance, uh, here and here. So this is an autosomal dominant disorder. They also say in the paper that they've confirmed that this is indeed Alzheimer's disease by looking at brain tissue of one family member at autopsy so they could see the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles in a, in a member of the family. They also charted the age at which this disease occurs and the onset is at 59 plus or minus four years. And they use this really cool technique called positional cloning, which relies on linkage analysis. And ultimately, positional cloning allows you to figure out, first of all, what chromosome the disease gene is located on, then where on that chromosome it's located, and finally, what specific mutation causes the disease. We said in looking at Mendelian genetics that if you're looking at two traits simultaneously, Mendel said that the traits had to follow one of his postulates, which is the law of independent assortment. So independent assortment um, shows that there's no linkage between the two traits. So just to give you an example, if you had a, a gene that caused color, a color pattern in, in peas, yellow and green, let's say, and the plant also had some sort of disease, a genetic disease that is. Uh, if you follow the inheritance pattern of color, say yellow or green, and you follow the inheritance pattern of the disease, if, if there's no correlation between the two, if it's just as likely when the plant has the disease that the peas would be green or yellow, then that shows no linkage between those two traits and indeed, that those traits segregate through independent assortment, as Mendel said. What this means is that those two traits are either on different chromosomes, or they're on the same chromosome, but so far apart that when gametes are formed and homologous recombination occurs, that those two alleles get separated in the formation of those gametes. If, however, there is a correlation between the color of the peas and the disease, that is to say, every time the pea was yellow, the plant had the disease, then those two genes, those two traits, show some level of linkage, and the closer they are, the higher the likelihood is that they get inherited together. This means that the genes for the traits must be on the same chromosome and located very close to one another. Let me try to draw this for you. Let's go back to humans and let's say that we have a male and he has two copies of chromosome 21. And of course, he received one copy of chromosome 21 from his mother and one copy of chromosome 21 from his father. And let's use a different trait. Let's use eye color. I'm just going to make up kind of a silly example. But let's say that there are two eye colors. The father has blue eyes and the mother has brown eyes. And the dot just represents where on chromosome 21 those two lie. And these are two different alleles. And let's also say that on chromosome 21 from the father there's a mutation that causes the genetic disease. And on the chromosome of the mother, the allele is wild type. Now in the process of gamete formation, 
homologous recombination occurs, and when that happens, a chromosome that's put into a sperm, in this case, because we're talking about a male, is a chimeric, that is sort of a mosaic of these two chromosomes. That is to say, this chromosome that ends up in the sperm gets some of chromosome 21 from the mother and some of the chromosome 21 from the father. And if we just schematically try to draw this, these lines are the point where homologous recombination occurs in my pretend example here, and like so. And so this part of the new chromosome 21 that's in the sperm came from the mother, this part came from the mother, and this part came from the mother, and this part here came from the father. So this sperm has a blue, a gene for blue eye color, and it has the disease gene. And this part came from the father, and this part came from the mother, like this. But it turns out that these two are close to one another, they show linkage, and if in the family every offspring that has blue eyes has the disease gene, it means that the gene for blue eye color and the disease and the disease gene are located on the same chromosome and very close to one another and therefore exhibit a high level of linkage. So the further away the disease gene from the marker, the more independent assortment it shows, or the less lower percentage of the time the two get inherited together, but if they always get inherited together, it means that they are very close to one another on the same chromosome. The two alleles are co-inherited. What I personally find very interesting about studying genetics and comparing genomes is that while we're very similar genetically, human being to human being, it's really those small genetic variations that make us who we are and different from one another. It could be changes in eye color or skin color or height, for instance, but also those differences may lead to genetic-based diseases, like we're talking about here. It also turns out that some of those variations can't be measured phenotypically. For instance, you could have a silent mutation so there is a change at the DNA level, but there's not a change in the amino acid sequence, and so there's no difference phenotypically, although that difference, that genomic difference, still exists. It's also true that differences between genomes can occur in non-coding sequences. We've said that only 1 to 2 percent of the genome is involved in coding RNA molecules and ultimately amino acid or protein sequences. The other 98% is in non-coding regions that uh, is involved in gene regulation and expression, for instance, but it doesn't ultimately encode a phenotype. In positional cloning, scientists compare the inheritance pattern of a disease gene that causes disease within a family and compares that to the inheritance pattern of other genetic differences that exist within the pedigree, that is, within the family. So just to try to reiterate what I'm saying, in order for positional cloning to work, you have to check thousands of genetic variations that exist within the family to follow their inheritance pattern. So just as a simple made-up example, if you knew that hair color was found on chromosome 1, and you studied the inheritance pattern of hair color and the inheritance pattern of the disease. If there is no significant, statistically significant overlap in those two inheritance patterns, then those two genes show no linkage. They segregate through independent assortment, and that marker, hair color, doesn't help you determine what chromosome the disease gene is located on.
However, after testing thousands of different traits in that same way, if you find a trait, let's say on chromosome 21, that's eye color, you know that eye color is, is determined by genes on chromosome 21. If eye color and the disease gene show the same inheritance pattern, so if you have two color eye colors, brown and blue, and every time someone has blue eyes, they also have the disease, and when they have brown eyes, they don't have the disease, then the gene, the allele that encodes for blue eye color and the allele that causes the disease are both on chromosome 21 and located in close proximity to one another. In this paper, the scientists test all of these genetic differences and they find one that co-segregates with the disease. And this genetic difference happens to lie on chromosome 21, which gave the group the knowledge that the disease gene is also on chromosome 21 and in close proximity. The genetic difference or the genetic marker that they used is this dinucleotide repeat, which is a strange phenomenon that happens in our genome and in other genomes as well, in which there are these sequences of dinucleotide repetitive sequences. For instance, TA, TA, TA. This is a dinucleotide, and it gets repeated over and over again. And these are in non-coding regions, but they've been mapped to different regions of our genome. And it turns out that one of these markers, one of these genetic variations, exists on chromosome 21. So it turns out that if we have two copies of chromosome 21 from mom, um, and let's call this M1 for her, cop, her first copy of chromosome 21. And let's call this M2. And the father in the family also has two copies of chromosome 21. And we will name them D1 and D2 for his two copies of the chromosome. Now, we know if we unravel these chromosomes, we can just look at the linear sequence of nucleotides that make up the chromosome. So this goes on for a very long time in this direction and in this direction as well. And let's say that this is mom 1. So it's chromosome 21, but it's her first copy and she could have a series of these TA, TA, TA sequences. And let's say for the sake of conversation that there are 25 repeated dinucleotide in this particular case. And then if we look at mom two, again, she has in this same region that repeat, but let's say that this contains a hundred copies of the repeat. And then if we look at dad number one, he also has a string of the, the repeats. And let's say his stretch is 50, oops, sorry, 50 repeats. And then on his second chromosome, he has a lot of TAs. So he has 200, okay, 
Now, if we design PCR primers against the region on opposite sides of the repeat, then this sequence right here would be the same as this sequence because, well, we're very similar genetically. We're talking about a genetic difference in the case of this sequence of dinucleotide repeats. So this primer would be identical. This is the upstream primer, and they that primer would bind to these two sequences if we were amplifying the mother's DNA in these two sequences uh, if we're looking at the father's DNA. And of course, if we look at a son or daughter's DNA, the primers would bind to the sites on their chromosomes as well. And then in the, in the, on this side, we could design a primer at the end of the dinucleotide repeat that would bind to the upper strand. And that sequence is identical to this sequence, or this sequence, or this sequence. It's just that there's a different number of dinucleotide repeats in between these two known and conserved sequences. So now, if we do a PCR reaction with DNA from the parents, so if we look at mom's DNA, she is going to get two PCR products, one that's a result of these two primers amplifying this region and the two primers amplifying this region. So she would get a band that's representative of the 25 trinucleotide repeat inserts. So we'll just label this 25. And then she would have one that's bigger, that's 100 has 100 repeats. And then the father, dad, would have one that's 50, so in between the 100 and the 25, and a second band that represents the 200. And let's say that dad is afflicted, and I'm going to draw a box around the afflicted individuals. Now, if we look at a son, and the son gets this 25 band from from his mother and he gets the uh, the 50 base pair band this is 50 and this is 200 and and it turns out that this son is not afflicted so if we look at a second son and he gets this 25 from his mother and he gets this 200 from his father, it turns out that he's afflicted. If we have a third son, and they get the 50 base pair from the father, and the 100 base pair from the mother, he is unafflicted. If we look at a daughter, and she has the 100 from the mother, and the 200 from the father, she is afflicted. If we have another son, and they get the 25 from the mother and the 200 from the father, they're afflicted. So, I hope that you can see that if any of the individuals in the family have this 200 dinucleotide repeats that they are afflicted, that means that the chromosome of these four chromosomes, the chromosome that contains the mutation that causes the disease in the family is on this chromosome, this copy of dad's chromosome. So now you can sequence in both directions away from this known area where the trinucleotide, I'm sorry, the dinucleotide repeat occurs and look for genes.
along the length of the chromosome. When they did that, they discovered a gene nearby, and the gene was amyloid precursor protein that had already been implicated in Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out when they did the sequence and they compared, in this case, the father's DNA with that of wild type individuals, they found a point mutation and the point mutation caused a change in amino acid sequence from a valine to a glycine. They then set out to test each individual in the family to determine whether all of those individuals that had the disease had that specific point mutation, and that turns out to be true. They also looked at some of the other families they were studying that had early onset forms of the disorder and found that in some of those families, they shared the exact same mutation. In addition, they have a note added in proof that they also found a family that had a point mutation at the same location at codon 717. However, the point mutation led to a change from, uh, instead of from valine to glycine, the point mutation changed the valine, valine to phenylalanine. Then as a control, they tested tissues from individuals that were negative for Alzheimer's disease in the normal population and found that none of those people have that particular point mutation. Together, the data strongly suggests that a point mutation at codon 717 is responsible for some of the forms of early onset Alzheimer's disease. Okay, the last thing I want to cover today is how we would go about determining whether an individual had that point mutation. We brought this up a while ago, and if we know in this particular case that uh, the mutation occurs at codon 717 of the amyloid precursor protein gene, we could look at the DNA of APP, and if the mutation is here, the point mutation is here, then we have to design a set of PCR primers that will amplify that particular region. So if we make a PCR primer here, which of course is identical to the sequence here, and we design a second primer, which is identical to this region here that would bind to this part of the molecule, then we will amplify this part of the DNA, and if we ran a gel, of course, we would get a band of the PCR product, but we don't have one copy of chromosome 21. We have two copies. So the second copy of the person in question would be wild type, and if you amplified with those same PCR primers, this region, then you would get a PCR product from this region and a PCR product from this region. And they would both, of course, run at the same molecular weight in the, uh, in the PCR, in the gel, in the PCR gel, because they're the same molecular weight. There's just a point a point mutation, a single nucleotide substitution. But if we sequence this band, you could cut this band out and sequence it, and it would correctly sequence the first nucleotide and the second nucleotide and the third nucleotide, and they would be identical here. So you would get a nice clean readout of the nucleotide sequence of this area. But once you got to the region where there was the substitution, the, the sequencing reaction would go awry. The machine wouldn't know what this sequence is because there are two different nucleotides, one that occupies this position at codon 717 in the mutated form and then in the wild type form. But you would detect a problem there and that would be indicative of the mutation. So you could, you could score it at that point as a 
difference between these two, so this person does indeed have a change from wild type in this particular version. The other possibility is to cut out this PCR product, which of course contains two different PCR products. And if you put that piece of auger in some liquid, the PCR products, which is of course double-stranded DNA, will come out of the agarose gel into solution. And then you can toss the auger slice out. And then if you add vector sequences, which we talked about before, and you incubate them with the PCR products, some of which contain the mutation and some of which don't, I'll put a little dash for the mutation, then the vector sequence can close up on the PCR product, which is now inserted into the vector, making it circular. Then you could have thousands of copies of the vector with this, in this case, wild type insert. And then you could have thousands of copies of vector with the mutated, I'm going to draw a little line like this, a little dash to indicate that. And then all of those can be put into bacteria like this and plated onto a Petri dish. So this is my Petri dish. And then the individual bacteria, each of which contains a single plasmid, and each plasmid contains either the wild type version from here or the mutated version from here. You can then grow these overnight and the single bacterial cells containing a single copy of the vector and whichever insert they received uh, replicates and you go from a single cell to a million cells overnight, millions of cells overnight. And then you can pick these now colonies that are a million cells or more and put them into liquid culture and grow them overnight so you amplify again the number of bacteria and the number of vectors and the number of copies of the insert. And then you can purify the vector out of the bacteria and send the individual vectors for sequencing. And then that way, if you pick, say, 10 colonies or so, it's very likely statistically that you'll get at least one representative from each of these. And in doing so, you will be able to determine specifically what this nucleotide mutation is compared to wild type and positively ID this individual for that specific mutation, which in this case um, led to a valine to a glycine substitution. Simple. So all you have to do if someone wants to know um, whether they have this point mutation is you take a cheek swab that contains DNA from cheek cells, you design the PCR primers, you do the amplification, you run a PCR gel, you could either just sequence the PCR reaction and notice whether there's an aberration at this point in the molecule, or you could go ahead and clone the PCR product and ultimately sequence specifically the two different strands, that from wild type and that from the mutated form, if the person has the mutation. Otherwise, they're just going to get two copies of the wild type form.
and um, they're good to go. Okay, everyone, that's it for today. Um, the session went a little bit longer than I had hoped. Uh, positional cloning is not the easiest technique to understand. I'm not going to ask you to reiterate everything that I just said. I'm hoping that you have a basic understanding of linkage analysis and how this particular technique works. Obviously, you can't do it in a weekend. It's a pretty laborious approach, but it's extremely important and many disease genes, many mutations have been discovered in this way and we're going to see this over and over again as we move forward in the course. I wanted to remind you that you should buy the next book, Island of the Colorblind by Oliver Sacks. It's about Micronesia, something near and dear to my heart, and about using positional cloning to find a gene that causes total colorblindness. Um, I like, in general, this format of using the drawing tablet, and I think I'm going to use this moving forward. I'm sure you all know that um, there will be no in-class sessions for the rest of the semester. So again, I'm sad about that, but I think it's the right call. Um, we may also add a Zoom session or two, particularly as we get closer to the exam. I haven't worked out the date for that yet. I'll let you know. I'll give you plenty of time for that. And uh, that's it. I'll, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. I hope you're all safe. Bye-bye.